So Horace, yes. what was it like to grow up in such a legacy of civil rights and social justice? Yeah. Well, to be honest, at a very early age, um, I kind of engaged in an epistemological, you know, encounter with God saying, you know, why would you put me in this context? You know, to sleep in Dr. King's home, to, to know every formidable black leader there was in and out of my house. For uh, like who, for example? Oh, I mean, Roy Wilkins, Whitney Young, I mean, Martin Luther King, um, you know, knew Harry Belafonte, Gottfried uh, Dillard. I mean, you name the Nipsey Russell. I mean, these people be in my basement with my dad. I mean, they were there because beyond whatever their professional commitment was, they were trying to make life better for other folks. I knew that God had placed me there to absorb as much as I could. You were there with the architects and designers. So can you share a little bit about yeah, how? Well, you know, my dad started in the labor movement. So he was vice president of the Negro American Labor Council in the 40s and 50s under A. Philip Randolph. Uh, Baird Rustin was his compatriot. The two of them staffed the March on Washington for jobs in the war industry. So it was not only civil rights, but it was the labor movement. And TULC was at the, he the, the hub of that, which is where King and everyone came. My dad took me everywhere. Yolanda King, who was my dear friend, we had a theatrical company, um, Dr. King's daughter. They didn't get to go. They were afraid for their lives and harm, but my dad took me. I went to planning uh, meetings. In 19, was it, maybe 62 uh, or maybe 64, uh, we went to Baltimore, uh, Maryland for the Negro American Labor Council. Dr. King was at that convention. And while we were there, an African-American was run over by a tractor in downtown Baltimore, integrating a skilled trade site. And so all of the people at the convention, all the black trade unionists from all the unions, maybe a thousand plus people plus folks in the community marched downtown to the site. And when we got there, Dr. King was only like five, four, five, five. He wasn't a tall fella, oh. you know, at all. Um, they had a reef and they wanted to hang this wreath on the fence. And Dr. King webbed his fingers and hoisted me up to put that wreath oh. uh, on the fence. But one of the lessons I learned from that was for the next two days in the convention, I kept telling my dad, when I grow up, I want to be a black leader. That, that's one of the, the most salient um, uh, experiences that I've had. And did your dad like Dr. King and others, did he have a, a, a target on his back? Oh, yeah. And, and, what, yeah. and, and even knowing that, yeah. and knowing what happens yeah. to certain leaders, yeah. you yeah. still wanted to lead. There was an incident with he and Charles Evers and Aaron Henry, who was president of Mississippi, in AACP, where they were actually surrounded by the Klan. Uh, I mean, it was harrowing. I mean, we, we as children would get calls, you know, my mother would bring us in and, and tell us that we had to pray for my dad because they didn't know he was gonna come, come home. Back. But that's when you know you're really committed. You know, when well, you Well, it must care. have been scary though as a kid. It was scary for me. I mean, you know, I love my dad. You know, he was uh, like my best friend. I worked with him till the day he died. Um, but at the same time, you know, he always explained you know, why he was doing what he was doing and why he was where he was done, uh, going. What's missing in our, in our relationships with each other, it, with our city, with our world, that, yeah. that we're not moving forward? I will say to you that having gone through the civil rights movement and, and having a draft card and, you know, I mean, the whole social upheaval behind the war in Vietnam, that I really think where we are right now is potentially worse than any of that. Look, we have people now who want to usurp the Constitution, care nothing about democracy, the principles and precepts upon which this government was founded, uh, just to maintain power because they know in 25 years, uh, you know, whites will be in the minority. Uh, and that's what frightens me because I think the closer we get to a multicultural society and one that recognizes that all people are really the same, the more dangerous it becomes and the more threatened they are. Uh, the positive note is if enough good people, if enough people of conscience, which is what Dr. King said, 
whites and blacks, gays and straights uh, come together and recognize that, you know, the principles and the precepts upon which this government was founded, liberty and justice for all, and actually embrace that. I'm encouraged that there's enough people uh, who feel differently. We just got to get them to act differently and then we can rid ourselves of this curse. The vast majority of people I know want to live in harmony and peace with one another. They just don't want to be shut out and excluded and discriminated against based on sexual preference, color of their skin, zip codes they live in, or anything else. So, um, I mean, that's how I see it. And I may be wrong. Um, I always choose to see it as half full, not half empty. And I believe, uh, as Dr. King did, in the innate goodness of people. And I think we've got to appeal to that um, and, uh, you know, do the best we can to make it happen.